welcome to Real Estate Resource. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll know when new videos are available. I really hope you enjoy this one. All right, so here we go. This is uh, what part three of the RPA, and I know it takes a while. It takes a you know several weeks for us to get through it, but it's because we go into so much detail. And I think for those of you specifically that want to become listing agents or that are listing agents now, your knowledge, your understanding of this contract and the ins and outs of it are really more important than a buyer's agent. Because as a buyer's agent, I could, I could kind of stumble through it, and I'm still going to have some built-in protection. So. That, you know, like they say, knowledge is power. Okay, so last week, I think what we finished on was the uh, time of possession, the seller occupied, the, ten the TOPA, the tenant occupied units. I think that's what we talked about last week. So let's move on now with the seller's documents. So the seller by default has seven days to deliver all of their documents that they're required to deliver. Now, that seller document, the delivery of those documents includes pre-sale city inspections, uh, any disclosures, any home inspection reports, any past termite reports. So uh, yesterday, uh, an agent was asking me, said, uh, you know, we didn't ask for a termite in the purchase agreement. But verbally, the listing agent just tells us, hey, we have a termite report. We're going to give it to you and we're going to do clearance verbally. There was no contractual agreement. Um. But they did provide them with the termite report. Now the seller doesn't want to do the termite. And there's not a lot of leverage from the buyer's side because there was nothing in writing agreeing to it. Like there was no request for repairs asking for it, anything like that. So that becomes a bit of a gray area. But they did provide that report. And as a listing agent, even if I don't have in the contract that I'm working this transaction with a request for a termite report, or, or any other report, if I have it, I have to deliver it, okay? So if I have a previous home inspection, or let's say that I, I opened escrow with a previous buyer, that, that deal canceled. I'm not even sharing my screen, am I? I'm just talking at you guys. I just realized I was doing that. Yes. <laughs> I apologize. Um, uh, I, just, I just realized what I was doing, so I apologize. I don't know what's going on with me. All right, let's see there. Now, now you're looking at what I'm talking about. All right. There we go. Sorry about that. I apologize. Okay. Seller delivery of doc documents, paragraph three and one, right? Which seven days is the default. So we just recap that. If I have anything from a previous escrow, I have to disclose it to the buyer. So if a buyer did, and you know, there's numerous inspections that a buyer can do besides a professional home inspection. If I have an inspection, if let's say they've done a soil stability or they did, you know, some other kind of test and I have a copy of it, I need to provide that to the buyer. Now, the reason I want to do that too, for me as a seller is not just because of transparency, but if I attach all of those inspection reports to my transfer disclosure, Right. I give them now it becomes part of my disclosure. So when we talk about all the time where um, we see people countering you, this property sold as is no repairs and the, and the contract. And we'll get to it later on in, in our in our classes. The contract already says we're selling you this property as is, but it's as is subject to the disclosures made by the seller and the inspections done by the buyer. That's the as is. We have that right, right? That's those periods of time for the buyer to do their due diligence. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and part of that due diligence is reviewing the disclosures. <coughs> Sorry about that. The disclosures and the documents that the seller provides. So the more things that I provide the buyer as the seller, the less liability I have and the more I'm actually selling the property as is. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so you should, you should really be encouraging your sellers, right? If you're dealing with an expired listing, ask them, have, were you an escrow before? Do you have any previous inspection reports, right? L let me even, let me see your previous disclosures so we can make sure that they were just, you know, you have the, the proper disclosures. I want to go over, every, over, over everything so we don't miss something. Because sellers forget stuff, right? And if we're not really clear with them on the disclosures and going through asking those questions, 
they can forget. So the more you disclose, the better. So the delivery of documents is everything that they need to del- that they need to provide is going to be listed right here in paragraph 14a. So when we get to 14a, we'll see everything that the seller has to provide in that seven days. Now, going back to the contingencies for the buyer on the review of the seller's documents, remember, it's a 17-day contingency, 17 days after acceptance, or five days after delivery, whichever is later. Five days after delivery, whichever is later. So they're not even, it used to say in 14A, if the seller was late delivery, which means they went past the seven days. Now it's just saying, if you give me a shortened contingency for reviewing the seller's documents, you've got to make sure that if you want me to remove in that contingency period, that I deliver them to you five days prior to whatever that contingency period is. So I know it says seven days. That's fine. We can stay with that seven days. But if I've shortened the contingency for a buyer's agent and said, you now have 10 days to review all of the documentation that my seller provides you and remove that contingency, I've got to give it to you within day five at the latest or else I'm giving you five days. You'll have till day 12. You guys follow? So. Remember, as listing agent, if I'm going to shorten these time periods, it also shortens some of the time periods for me to take action. So I, it's, it, I, I know that sellers and listing agents like to, hey, let's put some pressure on the buyers. Let's make sure that you know they're taking action quickly. But it also now reverts back to you and puts some pressure on you. So my suggestion as listing agent, if I am going to shorten those investigation periods, which includes reviewing the documentation I'm required to provide you, I need to have that documentation ASAP, which means if I'm going to do the disclosures, they should be done before I have an offer. If I'm going to, I should have a copy of, if I'm going to provide a termite report, I should have a copy of that termite report prior to. If I have a pre-sale inspection report, I should have, I should have ordered that pre-sale inspection report the moment I took the listing. If I got a, I have to provide a, um, I have to provide a, a preliminary title report. I need to have that prior to having an offer accepted. So there, you know, again, I know that sometimes we talk about old school stuff, right? We talk about how people used to do business or what the business was like, and it sounds a bit like, you know, I walked uphill both ways, to and from home to school in the snow uphill, right? We do those conversations. I know it sounds like that. But there used to be an agent. I don't even, I don't think he's still active. His name was Charlie Dunn. And it was his little tagline was done deal. But he would deliver all of the disclosures and seller's reports and any documents they required with counter offers. So you had it from day one. So basically, if you were accepting his counter, you were also, you were also approving the disclosures, which means you had to review the disclosures, sign the disclosures, and sign the counter offer before your offer was even accepted. Now, if you do something like that, then you could make their, you could make this review of seller's documents one day, two days, three days, seven days, whatever you want to do. You could shorten it as much as you want because I've already provided the documentation. But if you're shortening this down to seven days, which I see people do for all of these contingencies, like seven days for all this stuff, then you, you better have it ready to go and they better have it in their hands within one or two days of acceptance. Okay. So keep in mind when we put that pressure on the buyer side, we're also putting a little pressure on the seller side questions about the delivery of the documents. Anybody. All right, moving on sign and return escrow holder provision and instructions. So this is now a performance, a time for performance, right? Is signing. It's been there for a while, but you have five days from the date they got delivered to you to return them to escrow, which means now returning escrow instructions has become something that a notice to perform is able to be used with. So if a buyer is dragging their feet and not returning escrow instructions, if a seller is dragging their feet and not returning escrow instructions, somebody could technically send a notice to perform to return those escrow instructions. And if you don't do it, they could cancel on you, either party. So keep in mind that I know that sometimes, you know, you try to do escrow instructions and disclosures and all these things together. 
we're going to have to probably take a different approach to how we handle those things and do them in a timely manner because we're opening ourselves up to a transaction being canceled for something as silly as not returning escrow instructions. Now, remember, it's not from acceptance. It's from when you got them. So it's it's not even like you could blame, blame escrow and say, well, they didn't deliver them until then. Well, it doesn't matter. When they delivered them, it was five days after they delivered them, you return them. Okay? So keep that in, and keep that in mind. This one is a little bit difficult right here where it says time to pay fees for ordering HOA documents is three days after acceptance. The reason that becomes difficult is 99% of the time, those documents get ordered from escrow. Escrow is the one who does the order, pays the money to get those documents. The problem is escrow is not going to do it until, until the buyer's deposit hits escrow and clears, right? That they're going to use that money from the deposit to order those disclosures. Oops, crazy hands. They're going to use that money to do it. So maybe you want to increase the time on that because, again, it also could be, have you ordered the documents yet? No, we haven't ordered them. Okay, well, now it's a notice to perform because it's the seller's responsibility even though escrow is doing it, okay? Installation of smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detector, water heater bracing, all that stuff. Now, if the seller's going to be responsible for those things, they've got to be done in the first seven days after acceptance. The reason that that happens, and you've got to explain to your sellers why you want it to be that way, because if when the buyer does their appraisal and these items aren't done, there's no smoke detectors or they're not installed correctly or the water heater's not braced or, you know, whatever, whatever the case is. If it's not done when the appraisal gets done and then it becomes a condition of the appraisal and the appraiser has to come back out and do the inspection again to make sure that they're done so that they he can sign off and the property appraises the contract now says the seller is responsible for that reinspection so talk to your sellers maybe what we should start doing now so that that's not an issue is if we start to notice that there's no smoke detectors or the water heater may or may not be braced properly then we could do that in the process of get you know get that done after the listing agreement so it's done prior to us marketing it so we don't have to worry about that time crunch of doing it otherwise you got to do it or you got a counter back that says you know seller will do these things whatever it is install the smoke detectors the carbon dioxide water heater bracing any of that will be done prior to close of escrow any reinspection due to these three items by your appraisal is the responsibility of the buyer to pay for that reinspection you could do that you could do that if you wanted to cover them. Just we know that the majority of time, like the norm is that the seller does this stuff. So maybe we just take some action, be a little bit more proactive and do the, the things that we know need to be done. Evidence of representative authority. That's for when there's an entity seller. You got three days after acceptance. You have to show them proof of whatever that entity seller is. Right. So when I'm the representative, so like if it's a trust and I'm the successor trustee, we got to show them the copy of the trust that shows that we are the successor trustee. If it's a corporation, I got to show them that I'm an authorized officer of that corporation to do that. A partnership. Same thing. Right. And a, a probate. I've got to show them evidence that I have the authority to be the representative for this entity. None of us really ever ask for that. Really, the only one that we that really gets that provided is is escrow. But we should be more active in that as a buyer's agent, saying, "Hey, by the way, I haven't gotten that uh, proof of authority yet." So, something to keep in mind. Okay, that you and be prepared for that as listing agent, because just because most agents don't ask for it doesn't mean that you're going to be um, in a transaction sometime in the future where an agent is like, "I go, you know, by the book on everything that we do." So I, I, I dot every I and cross every T. So you haven't sent me this evidence yet. I need that. You got to be prepared. You don't want to be scrambling. So when you're taking listings, when you're taking listings um, as a listing agent, one of the things that should be on your checklist at the very beginning of taking that listing is if this is an entity, I, can you also provide me with that proof that you're able to uh, be the representative for this entity and for the buyer same thing if i'm writing an offer from a corporation you know as a trust whatever i have to show that proof also so be have that stuff prepared before you start writing offers because three days after acceptance i'm supposed to provide that uh an entity in the in the in the chat melissa says an entity would be like an llc or a trust yes that's an entity right a, a corporation an llc a partnership uh 
uh, or a trust. Those those are the entities. Uh, 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 power of attorney, also same thing. I have to show proof that I have the authority to sign on behalf of that person or entity. Uh, okay, questions so far? Anybody? No? Yeah, Jesus, go ahead. Okay, um, I have a situation where a client here uh, is actually also an agent. Mm -hmm. He's dealing with a client in Mexico and uh, he opened an entity here, an LLC, as, by himself. And um, now his brother from Mexico is sending him money to buy houses cash. Uh -huh. um, how does that work? Uh, I, I mean, I mean, that's tough to say. That's that's really more of an actual question. I mean, if he has the cash. Right. If, if his brother is, say, wiring it and it goes into his account and he uses that money from his account to purchase something under his corporation, I mean, as long as escrow doesn't have an issue with the length of time that the money or the seller doesn't have an issue with the length of time the money was in his account, that's probably not an issue. I mean, as long, he's buying it under his entity. If the money is coming out of his account, and now if it's wiring from an account in Mexico that has somebody else's name on it, that's probably going to be a different story. You're going to have issues with escrow and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't think that that's going to be a problem. Okay, moving on to the next page here. This is items included and excluded. So this is one of the issues that we deal with with this items included and excluded section is that listing agents will put on the MLS, right, that specific things are included. They'll put, you know, stove, washer, dryer, refrigerator, whatever is, is included. Buyer's agents will then write an offer and say, okay, well, it already says it's included, but they won't check off these boxes that say they're included. Okay. Um, and then as listing agent, we don't counter to remind them that these items are going to be included. And the reason that, that, that we have to do that is, number one, they may have forgot, which is okay, but we want it contractually to show these things are staying because we don't want there to be a question later because maybe those buyers didn't want those things. So they left them off on purpose. Now what happens is if my seller was intent on leaving them and my thought process as listing agents, is, well, I put on the MLS so everybody knows they're staying. If they stay after the close of escrow, now they become personal items and, and debris, right? And the contract says that the seller is supposed to leave the property clean of debris and personal items. So now it's personal items. So now what they've done is they've left a buyer who maybe didn't want these items. They've left them with items that they don't want. And now, you know, the seller could be liable for the cost of them removing those items. So as listing agent. We want to make this as active a process as possible. So if my seller is adamant that the stove, refrigerator, and washer and dryer are going to be included with the sale, and I get an offer that doesn't have any of those things checked off, I'm going to counter to say buyer is aware that refrigerator, washer, dryer, and stove are going to be left with the property at close of escrow. Let them now actively tell me, oh, no, no, I don't want those things so that we can make different arrangements or we can go with a different offer. But let's not just assume that it was a mistake because now then we have to deal at the close of escrow. We now have to deal with a buyer being upset that there's a refrigerator stove and washer and dryer that they didn't need because they already had one. Does that make sense, guys? So I know it sounds, I know it sounds like, Okay, but we already said, no, no, but the contract didn't say. Remember, the MLS is only binding for us as realtors. The only thing in there, the only information that's binding in there is for us as realtors is what one brokerage is going to pay another brokerage for procuring the buyer. Everything else that's in there is only information. Um, let me see. So if we don't put it on the RPA at the beginning, can we put it on the TDS later? Or is it supposed to be on an amendment? Ah, good question. Just because something is listed in the TDS doesn't mean it's also remaining with the property. In a lawsuit, it could be used, right? Like, well, you put it in the TDS. Like, for example, let's say that the 
buyers asked for the stove, the washer, and the dryer. And we countered back and said, well, no, we're not leaving that as seller. We want our washer and dryer. And then when we do the disclosures, we check, oh, you know, the seller goes, goes, oh, yeah, a stove. Yeah, we have one of those. And they check it off. And, yeah, it's working, right? They put that in the TDS, right? And then later on, the buyer says, wait a minute. You said in your TDS there was a stove, right? Our argument's going to be, well, we countered you that we weren't leaving it. We were taking it because the seller moved out and took the stove. If the buyer were to, say, sue the seller and say, we want that stove, yes, the contract is the binding agreement argument, but if they take the TDS to court and say, but your honor, they said they weren't leaving it, but then they checked it on the TDS, disclosed to us that it was in working order, why would they do that? It's not necessarily going to be like the judges go, ooh, you put on the TDS and you're going to lose. It just could be used against you. So just things you have to do. Make sure that if you're not leaving those items behind – Right. They're like if you're taking the refrigerator and the stove, the washer and dryer, do not put them on the TDS because they're not staying. OK. And we'll go into more of this when we do our TDS class again. Um, but if if you're doing this, like they left it off and you forgot to counter it, you got to do an amendment of existing agreement terms. You can't just put it on the disclosure and say, well, I put it in the disclosure. So you knew. No, 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 no. I said I didn't want these things. You didn't counter me because I didn't ask for them. You can't just put it in the disclosures and, and say, nope, they're your problem now. Okay, so no, you can't do that. You have to do that on an amendment that they would, you know, again, actively agree, yes, we're keeping these items. Okay, go ahead, Jesus. Okay, so let me get this straight. So we're not leaving the fridge and the stove. We should not add them up to the TDS? If you're not leaving it, don't put them on the TDS. Thank you. Yeah, because what do they care if my refrigerator works? It's not going to be there when they move in, right? I mean, that's what we have to think about it. We have to think about it like it's like it's disclosing, hey, by the way, you know, my Xbox is it's a little weird. It doesn't do Wi-Fi great. I put that on my disclosure. Well, what do I care? You're taking it with you when you leave, right? So kind of think of it the same way with those appliances. If they're not going to stay there, there's no need for us to tell them what the condition of those things are. Now, if they are, obviously I have to disclose what those conditions are. So, yeah, just if you're taking them out, if they're not included in this sale, leave them off the TDS, okay? All right. Um, you know, you can put any other additional items that you're asking to include, which may not be included, which would be, you know, personal items. A lot of this, like video doorbells, security cameras, these are like you see these smart things, wall mounted brackets for video or audio equipment, that kind of stuff. Some of those things you would think would be fixtures, so by default would be ex it would be included, and that's what a fixture is, right? A fixture is an item that is included in the sale of the property because it is part of the property technically because it's affixed to the property. So, um, you know, things that are are attached like light fixtures, right? Sconces, uh, uh, chandeliers, um, ceiling fans, right? Those kind of things are automatically included. So if I didn't want to, they would go into paragraph 3P2, which is the excluded items that I wanted to leave out, okay? Plants, stuff built onto the property, like, you know, gazebos that have a little foundation. There is a gray area with sheds, right? Like those sheds that just sit on a concrete pad, are they a fixture? Are they not? I would um, actively discuss those in contracts. Like if I'm saying I'm leaving that, that shed in the backyard, I would put... I'm including the shed like that shed stays because I don't want to take it down. I'm not going to move it because, again, since it's a gray area, it would be easy. It, it, it could be an argument made from a buyer like, oh, they left this the shed. I didn't want it. So I'm going to actively said shed in the backyard will remain with the property. OK, keep those things in mind. So this stuff that 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 you're putting here that that are are added on are sometimes not fixtures. OK, like this microwave, for example, if my microwave is one of those built in hood microwaves above the stove, I don't I don't have to check off the box to include it because that is a fixture. If my dishwasher and this is the silliest one, the dishwasher is a built in because there are portable dishwashers. But if my dishwasher is built in, it is a fixture and it is automatically included. The same goes for stove and, stoves and ovens. 
if you see those ovens, like the double ovens that are built into the cabinets, that's a fixture. I don't need to ask you to leave it. You're required to leave it. You got to tell me you're taking it, which nobody's going to do. That's odd. Can you imagine somebody's going to, I'm going to leave you a hole and just pull out these double stoves, right? Or I have a burner on my countertop and I'm taking that. No, that's not what's happening. When we're talking about these stoves, it's those, you know, those freestanding ones that just go in the gap between the cabinets. Okay. But if I have like a custom refrigerator that's part of the cabinetry that's built in, guess what? That's a fixture now. I don't need to ask you to leave it. You're required to. Same thing with the wire and wine fridge. Okay. Washers and dryers are never built in. So that's not something I have to worry about. But the wine fridges, refrigerators that are built in that are custom built into that kitchen, stoves that are built in, stove and ovens that are built in, microwaves that are built in, dishwashers that are, you know, in the cabinetry, those things are required to stay. OK, so you got to you got to understand that again, as a listing agent, you've got to ask the question. If you go into a kitchen and you see somebody has a really nice custom refrigerator, we've all seen them before, right? They look the front of them looks just like the cabinets. I know it sounds like a feels like a silly question to ask, but you need to ask them, by the way, this custom refrigerator, you are you, you, you are planning on leaving that, right? They might look at you funny. And if they do, you could say the reason I have to, I have to ask you that question is because you'd be surprised. But. People take them, okay? People take them, even when they're not supposed to. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, like this security equipment, like this kind of stuff, like the video doorbells, the cameras, the wall mount brackets, those are not fixtures. So if I have a television mounted on the wall, right, which the majority of people do nowadays, they mount their, their flat screen televisions on the wall, the television and the hardware that mounted it to the wall are not required to stay. Okay, they're not required to stay. So you have to keep that in mind. Okay, any questions about the items included? Okay, excluded items, again, that goes back to the fixture thing that we were just talking about. If there are specific fixtures, things that are by default staying with the property, but you want to take them, that's where you would put it, right? So like we talked about with chandeliers and light fixtures and ceiling fans and things like that, if there was some specific item that you wanted to keep, you could counter back if you're the listing agent to say, I'm, I'm going to keep these, these aren't included. Even if I put them in the MLS, I gotta put them, these are excluded items. Or if the buyer's asking you like, hey, I, you included these things, I want you to exclude them, right? That kind of stuff. Jesus, you have your hand up. Yes, I usually used to call my back. If they take the, the bracket of the TV, sometimes they leave them, sometimes they don't. Uh -huh. uh, but if they take them, they're going to have these substantial holes in there. So yeah. it's good to, to add in there to patch up the holes. If you're the buyer's agent, you could ask for that, but there's already a section in here in the contract. Oh, yeah. There's a section for it. Yeah, there's a section here in the contract that says that by default, they don't have to repair it, right? But you could check that they're going to repair the, the, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But yeah, you should always ask for that. You want that because you want your buyer, you know, it's it, the, the relationship with buyers is, is fragile as it is, right? And if they feel like they're having to take care of too many things, they start to blame you. So, okay. So that's items included, excluded. Okay, natural hazard zone disclosure report. This is a mandated disclosure. It has to be provided. Well, okay, let me rephrase that. It doesn't have to be provided and if you're going to also do a natural hazard disclosure statement, which is filled out by the seller, which is the seller saying, I know these things to be true or not true, right? So if, if, I'm, if I don't want to pay for a, an NHD report from a third-party company, my seller can fill out a form where they're the ones responsible for answering the questions on, is it a fire zone, is it a flood zone, is it an earthquake zone? None of your sellers know the answer to that information, and this way they're protected. They get that mandated disclosure taken care of, and it's somebody who knows the answers and is bonded and protects them from that. Okay, So if you are a listing agent, this should always be seller. You should never argue that it's a seller, okay? Never. You should never put it back on the buyer. Because it's a mandated disclosure from the seller, if we say, no, buyer, you're paying for this, could an argument be made that the seller didn't provide that disclosure? We don't want to do that. So yeah. they're not super expensive. If your seller refuses to pay for that, you pay for it. Because 
you also sign that disclosure as the listing agent. So that makes you semi-responsible for the disclosures that are on there. You got to make sure that that gets provided the way it's supposed to go. Please always check off the box for the provided by and put whoever your, your preferred NHD provider is when you're writing the offer or seller's choice, right? For us right now, as buyer's agents, when we're writing these, it's always going to be the majority of these things are going to be seller's choice. Okay. Uh, let me see. I got a question in the chat here. If a water heater gets stolen during escrow and they put in a replacement water heater, that's worse quality. How do you navigate that? Wow. Um, Good question. If you don't find out until after the escrow has closed, then it would be a civil matter. If it's prior to closing, like if it's, you find it out at your walkthrough and you've done your walkthrough at the right time, you delay closing and try to negotiate them to uh, replace it with a comparable water heater. And if they don't, then you have to make a decision on whether we want to jeopardize our deposit and cancel because of it, or if we want to close and then again, try to pursue them civilly. Okay. That's really all you could do. But you got to, I mean, a listing is a seller's responsible for whatever is in the property when they market it and sell it, when they accept that offer, the same quality has to be in there when they close it, whatever it is. Like, for example, if I tell them I'm not taking, like, if I take the ceiling fan, we talked about excluded. If I counter it and they accept it, I could do that. I mean, I shouldn't leave wires hanging out. If it were me, if that was part of the selling features of the house was this nice ceiling fan or chandelier or window fix or what, uh, light fixtures, whatever that is, I would say to the seller, if that's something that you are adamant that you're not going to leave with the property, take it down now, replace it with something comparable, and let's market it with the new ceiling fan so we don't have to counter it. I would do that because, you know, it, it, does, it does affect maybe the desirability of the property if we're starting to take away fixtures. If I am going to say, no, I don't want to do it until we get an offer accepted, I would say that, you know, maybe in the counter, it's not going to rep- it's not going to remain, but we're going to replace it with something comparable. You would do that. Right. I-, I think that's what you should do. And if if the seller is going to replace something that is broken, like a water heater, maybe or it got stolen. Right. Then it has to be replaced with something comparable. Right. That because that was there when the person bought the house and that was part of what was the desirability of the home was the condition of the home. And now it's in less of a condition when I wrote the offer. So yeah, they could be responsible if it's not a comparable um, water heater. Okay. So NHD, please make sure you get it done. Always ask for the environmental, right? Seller's choice is fine. Most of the NHD companies that are out there are all, you know, I don't want to say the same because it's the other people that work there and things like that, but they're bonded and they're going to get basically the same information. So you're okay with seller's choice. This next section right here, 3Q2 is relatively new, and it says click here for additional report. The only report that's here is the Fortress Wildfire Disclosure. That is not a required disclosure, okay? That is not a required disclosure. You could ask for it, but what that Fortress Wildfire Disclosure is, is it's a more detailed report. So, for example, a property that is in a high fire zone or a very high fire zone, that fortress wildfire disclosure, it could show that even though your property is in a high fire zone, it gets very specific to where those fire zones are and the danger to the property based on this report. And maybe that report could help your insurance because we all know that insurance is going to be an issue, uh, especially in California right now. And if you're in a fire sec- fire uh, area, high fire area, it's, it's very difficult. Um, so that could help or it could be the opposite. It could be like, oh, you're right in the middle of the worst fire here. But that's what that report does. And it isn't required. So if you're not going to ask for it, put not applicable and then take this off. There's no, nobody's providing it, right? Because you're not asking for it. If you are going to ask for it, then you check it off. You check for the seller. And then again, seller's choice. I don't care who provides this. I mean, it's a it's a one company that does it like that fortress wildfire this is the name of the company that does it it's just provided by one of the nhd companies that's all oh maria put a little note for us that that report costs 140 dollars uh that's for the single family if a condo you don't need it so there you go there you go so again not mandatory if you're a listing agent and you don't want to pay for it counter it out 
If you're a buyer's agent and you're not going to ask for it, please make sure you change this to not applicable and you make that to nothing and you don't check a box. Okay. All right. Uh, questions so far. All right. The next one, this blank report right here. That's if you're asking for a report that's not on, that's not already listed or is not a required thing for the seller to provide you like a city presale. Those city presales are already handled here in paragraph three, Q five and six. I don't need to ask for it here. It's here. The nine, a report, the city of Compton, city of Southgate, city of Maywood, whatever city has a report that's already covered in five and six and three Q five and six. Okay. Already done. So if I want the seller to provide those, that's going to be seller, seller. So here is for any reports that may not be normally included, like a termite report. So if against my advice, you're asking for a termite report or wood destroying pest report, whatever you want to call it, that's what you're going to put here, right? That's it. Just the report. This is only the report. The repairs are handled differently. I've seen, I've seen, and I just saw, I, I've seen in the past, and I just saw one yesterday, uh, agent wrote their offer asking f in this section in 3Q3, termite inspection and clearance. Well, that doesn't make sense. If I have to go to a text overflow addendum for it to say t uh, would, uh, termite inspection and clearance report. I mean, think about how that sounds as a sentence. This is just asking for the report. So if you're going to ask for it, which I would tell you don't do, unless you're a VA buyer, this is just the wood destroying pest or termite inspection report. That's it. That's it. I'll show you in a little bit where you're going to put their, the request for them to provide the clearance. But since I am totally against you guys asking for this, please don't leave it out. Leave that blank. Okay. And the reason I don't like you to put it in there is because then it becomes a lender requirement that there's a clearance. That's why. That's why I leave it out. Okay. So the smoke alarms, the carbon monoxide detectors, the water you're bracing. Remember, we said that the seller's responsible to have that done in the first seven days. This is who's going to pay for it, right? Like you could say, okay, I'll pay for it, but you got to do it, which means it's a bill that gets put back in escrow and it becomes a charge for the buyer side in closing. But that's not the norm. The norm is the seller's going to pay for it. If you're writing the software, always check off seller. If you're a listing agent, you got to explain to the seller that this is the norm, that this is the seller's responsibility to provide these things. Okay. All right. We just talked about Q5 and 6. That's the government required point of sale inspections and reports, right? So pre-sales, 9A, what any of that stuff is now the seller's responsibility to do. This section Q6 is the corrective measures that go along with those reports. So five is the report, six is the remedial actions and the corrections. Okay, so this is the report, this is the repairs. So if you've checked this off, so if, you're, if I'm listing agent and I get an offer like this, the seller is required to provide these reports. Buyers can't get them. Buyers can't get them. So if you're talking about the city of Southgate, City of Compton, any of those cities, the seller is responsible to provide that report, even if the buyer is going to take responsibility, even if, right? So if I'm a seller, if I'm a listing agent, I'm not countering this. I'm not countering this. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to pay for it. We're going to give it to you. Now, I might counter Q6 and say buyer to be responsible for any corrective measures or remedial actions based on city of Compton pre-sale inspection report. That I'll do, but I have to. You get, we have to get to the point where we start with this. I, it's not a waivable item, okay? Jesus, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, but actually that's a request in the government before a speaker or Darwin Park, uh, uh -huh. we just don't write anything, right? Don't, not don't even write if it. applicable. Not even if applicable. Yeah, yeah, no, don't write I anything. See right? I, I good, see good, yeah, yeah, good point, good point. What you would do is if I know I'm writing an offer in the, say, a city of Downey or city of Long Beach or whatever, well, let's take Long Beach out because they do have the garage inspections. If I'm writing, a, if I'm writing an offer anywhere outside of the cities that require pre-sale inspections and repairs, I'm not going to check the boxes if I'm the buyer. See, look, 
again, we've talked about in our writing the offer classes about for me as buyer's agent, the the quality of the buyer's qualifications, like their ability to qualify and how much money they have and how good their credit is and all that stuff is my ability to write a good offer is just as important. And if I start asking for things that aren't required, then ultimately what happens is it makes more work for a listing agent to things that I have to counter out. And the reason that you got to counter these is even in cities that don't require it. So we'll use Downey, for example. Downey across the street from us does not require city pre-sale inspections. Don't require them. We had an agent in this office as a listing agent that received an offer for his property in the city of Downey. On that offer, the buyer's agent checked off the box for 3Q, 5, and 6. Okay? He ignored it. He didn't counter it. He didn't put in the counter that this was not applicable, nothing. He made no reference to it. So we got deep into escrow near closing, and the buyer's agent said, why haven't you provided me with the city of Downey inspection report? And the listing agent justifiably said that doesn't exist there isn't one well we required it you better go get one like figure out how to make a city of downey inspection report exist which is a silly request but contractually what it does is it just gums up the works because we didn't address it in the counter from the very beginning so now we have an, a buyer's agent who's requesting something that doesn't exist, which is basically now saying, we want you to call the city and tell them, can you come inspect, the, inspect this property? Because even though you don't require it to do that, we want you to do it because the buyer's agent asked for it and I failed to remove it, right? So ultimately they didn't have to do any inspection. We talked to the broker for that agent and cleared it up. But if I do get an offer on a property that doesn't require government inspections, you got to counter it, even if it's not like even because there's nowhere to write if applicable, right? There's nowhere to write that this space is not for if, if applicable. This space is for both. That's that. That's what this space is for is if somebody clicks both, right? So don't if you see if applicable, it doesn't matter if they wrote it there because that's not what it means. I got to counter and say Q5 and 6 are not applicable to this sale, period. End of story. Okay. Questions about Q5 and 6. No? All right. Escrow fee. Always, always each their own. Not both, not seller, not... But unless you, as buyer, you're saying, hey, I'll pay all the escrow fees for both parties. It's always each their own. And the escrow holder is 99% of the time going to be seller's choice. Okay? Now, if you said, hey, wait, I'll pay all the escrow fees, maybe you could check off buyer and put on here your escrow. But each their own is the norm. Okay? Uh, what okay? What would you even write on that both line then? Oh, you're going back here. Like uh, both, you could say both. Uh, you know, uh, you could pay here uh, both uh, buyer to pay, you know, buyer to pay fifty percent, right? Right, whatever it is. Like we're paying both, or buyer to pay twenty percent of the cost. But it doesn't matter. That you could, it's just let's leave it at seller. But that's what that's for, right? If you want to address that. That's what the both would be. Same here with both. Like you put both 50-50, but each to pay their own. And especially as a listing agent, I want it to be pay their own because, I mean, I know that normally if somebody were to write 50-50 and we left it like that and it went to escrow, escrow is just going to charge the fees. But technically what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to take the total amount of the buyer's fees, total amount of the seller's fees, add them together, split them in half, and that's what they charge. So if your buyer got a if your buyer or your seller got some kind of a discount from escrow, which happens, then that as that discount gets eliminated basically because it gets split with the buyer's agent. Okay, so always, always each their own. Okay, title insurance always. The owner's title insurance policy is always the seller. It's an insurance policy to make sure that the seller is transferring over a clean title to the buyer. Now, could the buyer pay it? Yes, we could turn that back. If I'm writing the offer and I can't raise my sales price, but I want to try to, you know, help the, the, the seller to earn more money or to net more money, I could take on all these fees. If I have the cash to do it, I just don't have the ability to qualify for a higher amount. Sure, I could do that to try to increase my offer. But the norm is the seller's going to pay for this. Okay. And if the title company is different than the escrow holder, then I have to also write in here who the title company is. 
right? Here for us, the majority of the stuff we do, we have a separate escrow from a title. Some people have the same, their title company is their escrow company because titles have escrows. So that's only seller's choice if it's different than the escrow holder for title, okay? This buyer's lender title insurance policy, the buyer gets that on their own. That's a cost to the buyer to help ensure the buyer's ability to have clean title for the lender that's lending on the property. Okay. All right. All right. Questions so far, anything? All right. Moving on. County transfer tax fees. The norm is the seller pays those transfer tax fees. Could the buyer pay it? Sure. Could you counter to ask the buyer to pay it? Sure. Not an issue, but that is the norm is the seller is going to pay this. Okay. That County transfer tax is a dollar 10 per thousand, right? So you could do the math. And what I mean by that is if it was a $500,000 sale, you would time 500 times 500 by a dollar 10. And that would be your County transfer tax amount. Okay. So the norm is the seller pays for that. Again, buyer could pay for it. If you want to eliminate some costs to the seller to increase the strength of your offer, if the buyer has the ability to do that, if they don't, don't do that. City transfer tax fees, same thing. The norm is the seller gets a little bit more expensive. I think it's like $4.20 for the city of Los Angeles. I think Culver City has it. I think Santa Monica has it. But the majority of the cities that we do business in do not have a city transfer tax. You could leave them off if you know that we don't have a city transfer tax. Like, let's go back to Downey. We know they don't have a pre-sale inspection. We know they don't have a city transfer tax. We could leave that off if we're writing an offer in the city of Downey. Okay? If you don't know what it is or there is one or isn't one check the box uh good question how can we check um i'm probably google would be the best way to check uh cities with i mean there's other cities in the state of california that have them i'm just talking about the areas that we do business in uh don't have them so if i'm selling something in the city of la not only will i have the county transfer tax but i will have the city transfer tax which is much higher again i think it's like four dollars and twenty cents like four dollars and thirty cents it's something like that Right, so it's uh, it turns out to be like five dollars and twenty forty cents per thousand if I'm selling a house in the city of LA. So that could be a, a, a sub substantial amount of money, but you've already disclosed that to your seller as part of their net sheet, so it's usually not an issue um, with seller pushing back. Okay. HOA fee for preparing disclosures by default is the seller. The HOA cert fee by default is the buyer. Okay. The transfer fees. Again, the norm is the seller is going to pay for that. But again, I could counter a seller buyer to pay for it, or I could accept that cost as buyer if I want to include, right? The uh, if I want to increase the net to the seller, okay. But the norm is the seller on this. Private transfer fees. The default of this is seller, right? The default of that is seller. Now, private transfer fee is not something that we're going to deal with very often. Um, private transfer fee is usually something that's built in by a developer. That is a, a cost, they, uh, an amount that they charge the owner of the property when they sell it subsequently. Right. So like if I bought from Lennar or KB or Schulte or whatever, those other developers are that are out there, they may have put in a private transfer fee, which charges me that I have to pay them when I sell the property. The default is the seller's going to pay that because that's how that contract that I have with that developer works is that I'm responsible for paying that. Could we negotiate it that somebody else pays it? Sure. But the norm is the seller. And for the, the most part, right, in the, the, the resale residential homes that we do, 99% of the time there is no private transfer fee. So you don't have to check anything. Just leave it alone. It's defaulted to seller. And that's it. Okay. Fees and costs, these are other things that we can build in. So remember going back to this termite report back here, right, where somebody asked for a termite. This is where I would ask for the termite repairs and completion. Oh, I spelled completion wrong, huh? It's going to go to, uh, it's going to go to a, a text overflow addendum. So you could put, uh, you know, you could type the whole thing and it'll just say C text overflow addendum. But that's where I'm going to ask for that. Okay. That's where I'm asking for that. If I am going to have my buyer pay for a transaction coordinator commission, right? Pay the transaction coordinator that I have. You would put in uh, the amount of your TC fee 
and you would put transaction or let's so it fits here today for us TC commission um, we want to put in there that TC commission we want to put it that way it's just it's uh, more um, uh, just so we're compliant that we're not showing that we're charging a fee for something that's that that shouldn't be charged for um, I, look, this is, again, my opinion, if I have a transaction coordinator, I'm probably going to take that cost on myself, but you can uh, pass it on to your client and that's okay. I'm not judging. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And well, yeah, whatever company your TC works for, like for us, if it's the transaction coordinators that work for Century 20 All-Stars, that, that, that you have to make sure that that transaction coordinator commission is getting paid to Century 21 All-Stars. If you're you know, paying an outside one, you're probably going to have to pay that out of your pocket. Uh, Matthew, can you explain why getting clearance is important for termite? The only reason I'm putting that in here for the clearance is because if I'm asking for the repairs in the report in the offer, the lenders 99% of the time is going to make it a requirement for funding. So I want the seller to be responsible for it. Okay. That's why I need the clearance. If I get, if I just get a termite report, right, I didn't ask for it. Right. I'm not asking for it up above. I don't need to put in the clearance there. I have the ability to ask for those repairs when I do my own termite inspection as part of my request for repairs. And then it has nothing to do with the lender. So the only reason I would put this here is if I had requested that report, it was part of my purchase agreement. And I wanted to make sure that that was going to get taken care of so that I wouldn't have to pay it to get my loan approved. OK. All right. So that's that with the TC fee, the commission. Oh, Eric, go ahead. You have your hand up. Um, I noticed that uh, on that uh, on that um box right there, so we can put the termite um repairs and completion, something that you wrote. Yeah, uh, but it didn't fit. So can yeah, we... it's gonna go to a, it's gonna switch over to a text overflow addendum that'll be, it'll 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 be attached to the okay. Um, um, back then uh, we were using the word section one. Is that kind of the same? Well, section one repairs are the actual physical damage that already exists to the mm -hmm. property. Section two is preventative stuff. So in this case, if I just say I want the completion, the seller's taking responsibility for both section one and section two. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what's happening in this. If I want to counter and change that, then yeah, I could counter as listing agent and say, I'll be responsible for section one or I'll do any completion up to this amount buyer to be responsible for the balance if any right i could do all that stuff but if i were you right now i would just be leaving it out altogether okay got it thank you mm -hmm. okay um let's just finish home warranty real quick and then we'll be done for today home warranty plan chosen by the buyer the seller is the norm that we're going to want to do that know the costs of the plan that you're getting and what the coverages are I always see people put like $700 and then they don't put anything else. They just pick Old Republic. Oh, also, when you do like, for example, I'm doing Old Republic, do your your rep, right? So if it's Old Republic, it's Gloria Navarro, right? You put their name in there because if I'm writing an offer and it goes to an outside escrow and I just put Old Republic, they're going to pick their Old Republic home rep to get that, right? So same thing if I'm doing First American, Right. If I do first American on here, then I'm also going to put Rebecca. Right. So make sure that you're putting the name of your rep in there. Make sure that this cost that you're putting, like if I'm just asking for a basic home warranty, find out what a basic home warranty is. And I don't know off the top of my head what it is. Right? Let's, what is it like 460 or something for just a basic single family one? I don't know. Something like that. Right. So if that's it, if it's basic, then great. That's it. 460. I don't have to put anything else. But if I put an amount like $700, then I need to put what the coverage is here. I need to add the coverage because if I don't, what I'm asking for is a basic home warranty at a maximum cost of 700. So what that means is technically per the contract is that the seller only has to pay for a basic home warranty. They don't have to pay $700. Now I know what happens is people still order the whatever fits in that 700 and sometimes a seller pays it, but that's not what's supposed to happen. I could say that you're breaching the contract. Hey, listen, you asked me for a basic home warranty maximum, not to exceed 700. Well, a basic home warranty doesn't exceed 700. So I'm only paying for a basic. 
what you need to do is either put the name of the special plan, put roof, put pool, put AC, whatever the additional coverage is that I'm asking for with this additional cost. You got to put it in. You got to put it in. But as seller, if I want to at 700, I'm not paying that. I could counter back and say, we're going to pay you $460, $500 for a basic home warranty plan. And that's it. I'm done. I could do that. Okay. All right. Questions. Before I stop sharing and we go to lunch for the day. Anybody have any questions? No. Nope. All right. So let me stop the share here. Okay. So we're moving right along. We will continue uh, next week, I think. I don't think there's anything getting in the way next week. So next week, we should be continuing on with our next part of the purchase agreement. Uh, before I let you guys go, anything at all that you guys need before I let you go? No? Okay. This video will be up later today, probably in uh, next couple hours. Oh, Jesus, you unmuted. Did you want to say something? I was going to say, I'll just go back, you, bug you to your desk. No worries. <laughs> All right. So uh, video will be up. If you missed any, if you missed the beginning, you want to revisit, it'll be up in the next hour or two on YouTube. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. Have a great day and I will see you soon. Mm -hmm.